Father God, I pray that in these moments as your word is proclaimed, that you visit our hearts in such a way that we know we've been in the presence of the risen Christ. Let your word speak to us, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Not long ago, I visited uh, for the first time with a family whose home turned out to be somewhat off the grid. I listened carefully as my GPS gave me directions to their address, and I followed every instruction that that sweet lady said until it told me to turn down what appeared to me to be a nothing more than a farm lane, a muddy path that ran alongside a recently harvested field. According to the GPS, that path had a name, but I didn't see any signs anywhere around. All I saw was mud. As I didn't say it out loud, but I was wondering, are you sure this is the right way? In the classic movie, The Wizard of Oz, the munchkin sent Dorothy on her way to the Emerald City with the instructions to... Can you say it like munchkins? Yeah, that sounds more right. Thank you very much. I wondered if I could get you to do that or not, but uh, thank you for playing along. Um, like me, she followed her instructions, and she headed off into the directions, faithfully following that yellow brick road, until it came to a place where it went in two different directions around a hill. And she wasn't sure what to do there. That's where she met the scarecrow. Remember the scene? And the scarecrow gave her directions first, He said, go that way, and then he said, go that way, and then he went like this, and then he admitted he had no idea which way was the right way. So in a a musical number, or music, whatever, you have some conundrum that you don't know what to do, what do you do? You dance a little bit, you sing a little bit, and then you head off in a direction, and you never tell anybody why that's the side that you picked, but off that they went. But was it the right way? Are they sure? Throughout this Lenten season, you and I have been focused on following a particular road. It's not a yellow brick road. It's not even a muddy farm lane. We've simply called it the way, based on the teaching of Jesus in John chapter 14, 6. Now, some of you have been working to memorize that, and this is your payoff day. So if you could say that verse with me without looking to the screen, do it. Everybody else who doesn't have it committed to memory, please say it along with me. You can read it off the screen with me. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. And we have made a commitment over the seven weeks of this Lenten season to follow Jesus along the way because we believe he knows what he's talking about. We believe he's speaking the truth when he says that the way of Jesus is the only way that will ever lead us to God. And over these last seven weeks, we've seen how throughout his earthly ministry, Jesus brought his disciples and us along that way that was different than every other way that we could possibly imagine. And we've learned that no other religion or philosophy can take us to the same places that the way of Jesus will take us. And it's especially true that the way of Jesus is the only way that we can come to heaven. No one sees the Father except by following the way of Jesus, except through him. Now, a few weeks, a few months or so before the events of this last Holy Week, Jesus began to talk to his disciples about what the final few miles of that way were going to look like. And he told them that he was going to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he would be killed, and on the third day he would be raised to life. But because they had been raised in a different um, religious background, a different religious culture that offered to them a different way, they didn't believe a word he said. To them, what they had been taught their whole lives through their religion was that the Messiah would come and the Messiah would overthrow all of their enemies. He would be a conquering hero. So the way of Jesus that he prescribes in these verses made absolutely no sense to them. And they definitely didn't believe it. They felt, in fact, that they needed to set Jesus straight because he clearly was lost. And so they told him, Peter stepped up 
to speak. Peter, bless his heart, always has something stupid to say, and he doesn't disappoint us today when he says, never, Lord. That will never happen to you. In other words, Lord, Lord, that's not your way. That's not the way you're going to go. Your road doesn't go that direction. There's no way, Lord, that your way will lead to a cross and it will never lead to an empty tomb. I mean, who ever heard of a conquering hero dying? No, they ride into town on the white stallion afterwards. But Jesus knew better. He was right. He knew that his way would lead people into places that they never expected to go. And, in, and this week we've seen how that way of Jesus has directed him to a place where he would be arrested and tortured and tried and crucified. And ultimately, as we'll see today, that way will bring us to an empty tomb. There are many roads in this world, many roads that will take you many different places. The world will try to convince you that those other ways will eventually lead you to God. But today's gospel lesson makes it very clear that unless the road you are on takes you past an empty tomb, it's the wrong road. Those roads cannot take you there. Only one way will ever lead you to God. No one comes to the Father right by, except by me. The way of Jesus is the only way that will ever take you to an empty tomb. Now let me tell you why that's important. It's important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's only the empty tomb that could bring hope to your hopelessness. Our gospel text begins in an atmosphere of hopelessness. Picture it. Three women, all close followers of Jesus, got up very early to go to a tomb. They didn't know it was empty when they got up. The last thing they had seen was the body of Jesus taken off the cross and placed into that tomb. But they had a job to do. First hand, they had seen him die. First hand, they'd seen him placed in that tomb. And they knew that he had to be embalmed. That was the responsibility of the family and friends. And there hadn't been time for that to happen. So they got up very early in the morning to take those embalming spices to the tomb to do the thing that had to be done. Now, I personally can imagine them walking along in, in total silence as they left their, their home. Their words, worlds had been shattered. Every hope that they'd ever had about this Jesus Messiah and all that he taught and all that they had hoped that he would be, it, it was gone. Jesus had died. They'd seen it happen. You don't talk much when your world is shattered, do you? Walking along in silence, all of a sudden, one of them broke the silence with a question. Who will roll away the stone? And I can picture that that despair and that hopelessness that they had in that moment went even deeper. Because now, on top of their grief, they were faced with the realization they would not be able to do for Jesus the most basic thing that they could do. And still they walked on. They didn't know it at the time, but they were walking in the way of Jesus because they were walking in the way that would take them to an empty tomb, an empty tomb where all of their hopelessness would be restored and replaced with hope once again. The story is told of a young mother who found herself on the last train out of Poland during the regime of, of Adolf Hitler. She was towing along with her her two-year-old toddler and, and her newborn baby. The bombing was fierce, and many times the train had to stop along the way so that the passengers could take cover. When they got, um, so the trip that should have taken just a couple of hours took several days. All along the way, the train uh, ran out of food and water. So consequently, when they arrived at their destination, that little baby was starving and ill. A, a group of nuns met him at the station, and so they took the baby from the mother's arms and said they would take her to their hospital to begin nursing her back to health while the mom filled out all of the immigration papers that day. There was a sense of relief in that mom's heart that her baby was going to be cared for. But that joy was short-lived because the next morning she heard that that hospital had been bombed by the Nazis overnight and that all the people who were in it, including her baby, had not survived. 
She was given a flashlight so she could go look for her baby's body, that she might bury it. What a tragic scene. What a tragic scene. Coming to a place of death, knowing that the one you love is there, and you have a duty that you have to fulfill. Well, as she was searching through the rubbles, there sobbing herself and listening to the sobs of all the other families that were there, she suddenly heard the faint cry of a baby. No way. It couldn't be. She went to where that cry was coming from, and, and there she found her baby alive. Found her baby alive. Let me tell you that life with only, or excuse me, life without the empty tomb would provide some only hopelessness to us. If we had no empty tomb, there would be no sense of hope there. But the tomb is empty. And because the tomb is empty, that means everything changes. Easter Sunday changes the mood for everything that you're experiencing in your life. That same hope that pours into the hopeless heart today as we make our way is the hope of the empty tomb. No matter what is happening in your life right now, no matter what it is that you're facing, no matter how serious it is, no matter how significant it is, no matter whether you have a plan or no plan at all, whatever you're facing right now, you have hope because the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen, and that makes all the difference in the world. Now, the text also tells us that the empty tomb offers for us a second chance. That's the teaching in verse 7. But go and tell the disciples and Peter, the disciples and Peter. By this time in the story, Jesus was down to 11 disciples. If, you're, if you know the story of Jesus, you know that the 12th disciple, a man named Judas, um, had learned too late that his way was not the way of Jesus. And so he chose to end his life. A very sad ending. If you want to read the story of that ending, you can read it in Matthew chapter 27. Jesus didn't, or Judas didn't hang around long enough to learn about an empty tomb and to learn the truth that Peter will learn here in this passage. Out of those 11 disciples who remained, only one gets singled out by the, by the angel in those instructions to the women. To just Peter, go tell the disciples and Peter. Peter had messed up often in the time that he had walked with Jesus, but he'd really messed up this previous week. Despite his passioned promises that he would stand by Jesus to the bitter end, he failed. When the pressure was put on, he denied even knowing who Jesus was. And he did it three times. In deep despair, Peter knew that he could never experience forgiveness for that. He had messed up as bad as anybody could mess up. But what Peter didn't understand was the way of Jesus leads to the empty tomb. What Peter didn't know was that every sin, because of the empty tomb, every sin, every shortcoming, every failure, everything that we experience on the negative side of life is forgiven by the power of Jesus Christ because the tomb is empty. The cross was the place of sacrifice, but that sacrifice would not be complete had the tomb not become empty. If Jesus had remained dead, he would have been like every other Passover lamb through the thousands of years of Jewish history. It's sacrificed and it's died, and we have to repeat the process. No other religion, no other way offers you an empty tomb. So no other way other than the way of Jesus can offer you the second chance that Jesus can. One devotional writer posted this on his blog and said this, when was the last time you were given a second chance? For me, it was the other night. I'd been struggling with a problem in my life. I went to my room and I prayed. I said, God, please help me. You know that I can't handle this situation on my own. I need you. I need the Lord Most High to set me free. Forgive me, Lord. Amen. He said, I told God I needed him to give me a second chance, a chance to change. And like Ebenezer Scrooge on Christmas Eve, it came with a price. The spirits of Christmas past, present, and future visiting was the price Scrooge had to pay. For me, the price paid was the blood of Jesus, shed on a cross, 
and secured by His resurrection three days later. I prayed that God would give me a second chance. I asked Him to take me and mold me and shape me into what He wanted to be. And I've learned in my short life that God not only hears those prayers, but He acts on them. And right now I'm living my second chance. Today you and I celebrate an empty tomb. No matter what you have done, thought, or, or said, Jesus invites you to walk with Him along the path that leads you to an empty tomb, to walk in His way. Come to the empty tomb that He says. Lewis Carroll, who was the author of the stories about Alice in the Wonderland, once said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will get you there. Attempting to quote that famous line, Yankees uh, catcher Yogi Berra, the legendary Yogi Berra, said it like this, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up someplace else. Both those statements are true. Both those statements are true. But I want to stand here before you and tell you I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. Every follower of Jesus Christ who walks in the way of Jesus will know his eternal destination. I'm going to heaven. That's where I'm headed. And I know that the only way that I can get there is to walk in the way of Jesus. Because no one comes to the Father except through Him. Now, if you ever want to know more about this and what I mean, I invite you to talk with me. I've got business cards spread all over that Narthex area out there. You can take one of them. And if you don't have a chance to talk to me when the service is over, and give me a call. I'd love to talk to you about it. But in the meantime, let's pray. Lord Jesus, You're the way, the truth, and the life. Help me this day to put my trust fully in You and to follow You in the way of Jesus. Amen.